without further ado, I'm very honored to have Michael as our speaker tonight. Uh, let's give him love and, and honor. Uh, he's awesome. Go ahead, Michael. Hey, Jordan. Thanks for uh, the opportunity tonight. I think this is an awesome idea, a um, great concept to begin a new top, new way of bringing about answers to the questions that we have. Um, again, I'm Michael Miano. I'm pastor here at Blue Point Bible Church, also the director of the Power of Preterism Network. And um, I'm excited because I do believe that we all have a host of questions in regards to eschatology, in regards to the end times, and over the Internet tends to be a rather uh, hectic time to try to get answers. So what I want to do tonight is set a foundation, give a, get us back to the basics of where the conversation must begin if we want to tru truly find wholesome answers in regards to what this means for my life, um, why should I even bother studying eschatology, um, and ultimately what eschatology means for those of us that are in Christ today. And what the, the topic or the title of this message is going to be the efficacy of the local church. And what I'm going to be speaking about is uh, speaking mainly from my perspective as pastor at Blue Point Bible Church. I truly believe that I have been blessed um, with the privilege to pastor Blue Point Bible Church. I believe I've been blessed with an amazing group of people that God has put together that truly build upon one another's strengths and fill in the gap in areas where we, one of us or either any of us may be weak. And, you know, again, to just go back to the title, the efficacy, that the word efficacy simply means the ability to produce a desired result or intended result. So what we're going to be talking about, or what I'm going to give you this short talk about tonight, is on how the local church and what the local church is intended to produce. So going in our Bible to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 24, we read, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For I'm sorry, that's chapter 10. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, yes, verse 24, starting at verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, verse 25, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now that verse for a lot of Preterist seems to pose an issue because that day was pointing to the day of the coming of the Lord. And those of us that have come to understand the preterist position believe that the coming of the Lord has indeed occurred, especially as we see outlined through the book of Hebrews, that coming that the, the Hebrews would have been waiting for to consummate their covenant. So we, we've come to understand that that day has come. And now we see in preterism that there's the question of, well, then what do we do next? And I do believe that to be a proper question after you understand fulfillment. So in spring 2013, a popular magazine entitled Fulfilled Magazine, a very popular magazine in the preterist community, had an issue entitled The Modern Church. Is it biblically based? And what you found in that article was a, a rather challenging message to the modern church from a brother named Bill Young. And I had taken the liberties to email Bill Young and ask him further his views about the church. Did he believe that there was an institution of the church today? And then I've gone and put that out pretty much to the public in social networking and in the preterist community in regards to what we're saying about gathering together as believers. And I'll tell you, I found a whole host of confusion. More arguing and bickering over what the word ecclesia means in its proper context and healthy conversation in regards to how we can move forward to worship God. That's where our conversation must begin, with what are we doing and why are we desiring to know these details and how will they affect our worship of our God. Again, we see in John chapter 4, verse 24, that God desires worshipers in spirit and in truth. And that's what we are indeed called to. Again, a very popular question within preterism is that, do we still celebrate communion? Should we still celebrate communion? I had this question posed to me by a congregant last week, and that is a very valid question. What are we saying? If the, the Lord has come and he said to celebrate communion until he comes, what indeed are we to say to those details in 1 Corinthians chapter 11? And if we truly understand the context of what the Hebrews and what Israel was hoping for and the fulfillment of that, which is full preterism, we would understand that what I was just talking about is his presence found in and through the church. That's where God's presence can be found, in and through his people. And that is the glorious reality that was waited for by Israel. 
That's what the hope of Israel was. When would that restoration of God's presence that Adam and Eve enjoyed, when would that be given back to God's people? I would venture to say about 80% of the full preterists whom you correspond with in any social network, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Pal Talk, do not attend or gather with a local church. About 99% of the partial preterists may attend or gather with a church. However, they nor the church focus on the reforming efforts of preterism within Christianity. This must be troublesome to all of us. It surely is to me. When I say I believe there's power in preterism, I'm saying that preterism brings reform into the body that enables us to further have answers for those that ask those answers of us. I believe that preterism stands the test of proving all things as outlined in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. And ultimately, preterism, when studied out, allows for the renewing of our minds into the biblical worldview of worshiping God in spirit and in truth. How and why would we think it is acceptable or would we settle with the Reformation, the power of preterism being done outside of the local setting of Christianity, the local church? If the reform is not being done in the church with God's people, whom will God send to bring those reforming efforts into the world? Frank Yerby has a book, The Once and Future Israel, in where he says that the church is suffering from an identity crisis that is largely self-inflicted. I would say a large majority of that self-infliction comes from failure to study to show ourselves approved, failure to see the ever-reforming nature of the Christian church, how if God is going to bring together sinners, we're going to continually have the need to be reforming our minds according to the word of God. And we can never harp on the complete rightness of our tradition. To borrow a couple quotes, J.I. Packer has a, a rather long quote, I'm not going to read that, where he says that we can never excuse ourselves the reforming of our tradition, of our paradigm. We must recognize that there's so much that has come to us through TV, through news, through media, through books, that we really need to have the reforming effort of studying the scriptures, continually challenging ourselves in regards to what they say, and finding the details in their proper context. Amen. Also, John Stott said, It is essential to give up the illusion that we come to the biblical text as innocent, objective, impartial, culture-free investigators, for we are nothing of the kind. No, the spectacles through which we look at the Bible, however open we may keep it, are not empty. So we must recognize that need for the reforming efforts within the body of Christ. Again, we see the church, Frank, to quote Frank Yerby one more time, the church as the fulfillment of much Old Testament prophecy is the culmination of the progressive revelation of God as epitomized by the principle, first the natural, Old Covenant Israel, and the spiritual. So we see this term ecclesia for the church, meaning the called out ones, which was in the first century was the calling out of the Jew and Gentile into the glorious riches of grace in Christ. We would understand this to be the manifestation of his kingdom, which we read about in Isaiah chapter 9, that eternal kingdom. So, of course, the church is here to stay because the church is simply the outpost of the kingdom of God. One of the things I must say about the power of a local body is what Margaret Mead, a very famous sociologist, had said. She said, never doubt that a group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world because, indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And, again, that goes back to the Christian's very first concept of what we come from. When we look at the first century church, Tertullian, second century church father, says that it's the blood of the martyrs that is the seed of the church. That's the foundation that we stand upon, and that is what God has instituted as his eternal plan. We see this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, as well as Ephesians chapter 3, verse 15. Ephesians 2, 15 is talking about how God was forming one new man out of Jew and Gentile. We see in Ephesians 3.15 that that being the church is called, the Jew and Gentile now in Christ, are called to make known the manifold wisdom of God. Again, that was God's plan to create this glorious reality that God's wisdom would be made known to the nations through Jew and Gentile. And I'm going to give you a scriptural response to that here in Ezekiel chapter 47. I was about to tell you the Pew Bible. I forgot that I'm not speaking to the congregation here. So in Ezekiel chapter 47, we read the following. 
Again, this is a prophecy given to Ezekiel about the restored temple. And if I may just qualify this text a bit, this is actually a text that is pointing out to the Messianic temple that would be restored after the resurrection of the dead that we read about in Ezekiel chapter 37. So you have the resurrection of the dead, and then after that resurrection is going to be the restored temple. You can read about this in the New Testament in Revelation chapter 21. So here in Ezekiel 47, I just want to read a couple verses out of this pass, out of this chapter. The here, host has joined the conference. Here, speaking in chapter six, uh, verse 6 in Ezekiel chapter 47, it says, He said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me back to the bank of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, on the bank of the river there were very many trees, on one side and on the other. Then he said to me, These waters go out toward the eastern region and go down into the Areba. Then they go toward the sea, being made to flow into the sea, and the waters of the sea become fresh. It will come about that every living creature which swarms in every place where the river goes will live. And there will be very many fish, for these waters go there, and others become fresh. So everything will live there when the river goes. And it will come about that fishermen will stand beside it, from Engedi to Eniglin. There will be a place for the spreading of nets. Their fish will be according to their kind, like the fish of the great sea, very many. But its swamps and its marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. By the river on its bank, on one side and on the other, will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither. Their fruit will not fail. They will bear every month because of the water that flows from the sanctuary. And their fruit will be for food and their leaves for healing. And we know when we turn to Revelation chapter 21, we read the exact same prophecy being fulfilled. That that new heaven and new earth is coming out of heaven from God. That the healing is being made manifest. No more death, no more crying, no more mourning or tears. All things that characterize that old order. And we know this to be a covenant change, a transition of what is being spoken about in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. Now imagine a large body of water that raises the dead to life. Yet the large body has no local ports. The water has no way of reaching inland, finding the people that are all the way within the land. Again, in Israel, that would have been a decent concept. However, what about this river when it's this river of water, this body of water that is trying to get to the heart of Africa or to the heart of the United States or to the heart of Canada, to the heart of India? I have always loved to look at the local church as a sort of outpost of the kingdom. This is not foreign to scripture at all. Consider that Israel had tribes and God ordered specific things to each tribe. Throughout scripture, we also see the use of the Hellenistic understanding of the term body as an assembly or group of items or people, more specifically groups of slaves in the Greek culture. So as we begin to truly understand, and hopefully you're seeing this, that that large body of water, the kingdom of God that was made manifest in the first century that the preterist stands upon, that that must be realized in a local expression. Otherwise, we have a large body of water that cannot reach inland to the people. The local church is simply an outpost of the kingdom of God. So now when we begin to contemplate that, and we begin to see that as a very serious factor, that that is what is going to be the, the power of God, the, the presence of God revealed to this world, we begin to ask ourselves, upon what confession do the saints stand as a body? In other words, what, is, what are our convictions as a local church? What makes somebody a Christian? How can we worship together in spirit and in truth and do so with a clear conscience in regards to what we believe and what we're worshiping? What constitutes a local church? Again, this, these are very, very valid questions, and I believe Scripture is very clear on them. Again, I, I've had a way I, I've qualified the, the phrase Christian, and I've said it like this. A Christian is one who desires to live like and worship through Jesus Christ. And if we can get that and we can stand upon that principle and give each other grace to grow and study and to learn, but we must come together as a people who desire to live like and worship through Jesus Christ. Only when we as a global community recognize our local responsibility will we truly see the reforming effects of preterism take place into maturity. Recently, I've seen a video on YouTube of a gentleman talking about the evangelical church and preterism. 
and he began to speak about all the confusion and how a preterist should not find themselves going into a local evangelical church, that they should find a preterist church to connect with. Again, I find that all to be just rather confusion. I'm just going to simply quote Martin Luther on this. One of the reformers that has led to the Protestant Reformation, he said, Farewell to those who want an entirely pure and purified church. This is plainly wanting no church at all. However, let me just meet that with a paradox, and then I'll qualify both statements. Martin Luther King Jr. said, The God of our fathers is a God of revolution. He will not be content with anything less than perfection in his children and in society. And we should be okay with both of those phrases. We should be okay with saying that the church is not perfect in the matters that it has everything right, that the people are all perfect people. However, we should also demand perfection, that we should want to be God's perfect witness to this world and to our society, and we should not stop until every thing that needs healing is healed, and every sickness is healed, and every hurt is made right. Again, we should, we should live in that paradox. However, we must recognize that the church is made up of feeble sinners that are called by God's grace and united together in that grace. So we must accept the church for what it is. I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer made a remark that if we request anything of the church, we're creating an ideal rather than recognizing the church as a divine reality. We begin to put our own ideals upon what the church should be rather than recognize what God had put together. Again, mentioning Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, Jew and Gentile into one new man. Just because that's not as clear and consistent and as desirous to those of us in the 21st century, let us not negate what that meant in its first century primary context to the Jews and Gentiles then. Surely the church is a glorious reality. And again, to say that we shouldn't unite with quote-unquote evangelicals who, who, who don't know necessarily where they agree and disagree with one another. Again, I, I meet with pastors myself. I meet with an evangelical committee every month. And I meet with men that are honest about the confusion in regards to eschatology. I meet with men that are honest in regards to challenging their paradigms. They're not yet preterists. They might not agree with me on everything. Yet they're convicted and convinced of the truth and grace that was provided through Jesus Christ. That's what we build the kingdom upon. That's how the kingdom is expanded through a local body. Again, if the kingdom is the, the large picture that we have of what God is doing in this world, the only way to make that manifest to a person in my community is to tell Christians they must gather together in a local body. I'm sorry that I must take this away from us and make it less about our movement and more about what God's movement is through his church. Again, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 15, God created the church so that the church would make known the manifold wisdom of God. I must say, healing and discipleship through the local body is amazing. I, I can personally testify to the healing and the discipleship that is found through that body. Again, you think about the concept that we all have moments where we may have impure motives. However, we have a local body. If you're gathering with a local body, you know the power of a local body to expose your motives. Nobody even has to say anything. They will just the power of a body. If you have areas of your life that need encouragement or empowerment, plugging into a local body of Christ where the people are focused on living and desiring to be like Jesus and worship through Jesus Christ can be the most empowering thing that will happen in your life. Again, these are things that I can testify to the power of, and we see the very simple truth all throughout Scripture. Yet so many want to do away with that. We can find examination, exhortation, academic controversy even in the church. We have a generation that is dying for people to just challenge each other and debate. And we see how when we watch these presidential elections, everybody's staying home on a Thursday night just to make sure they could watch the elections. What happens when we bring that back into the church? The church is not an institution that says, just stop and listen to me. But it says, no, we can all speak. And we can all ask questions. And we can all challenge each other and prove all things and walk worthy of what we read about in First Thessalonians 5. And then we begin to think about outreach through the local body. And this is where it gets close to home. When we begin to think about how do we help the person in our community to the best of our ability. You know, I could pull out my wallet and help them. But then I worry if I'm enabling somebody and we hear all these talks about what's the right way to do outreach. And the one thing I have learned is the best way to do outreach is in the group of people. It's to make sure that you're doing it in an assembly of people where you're rightly considering things. Again, love without wisdom is not love. And wisdom is found with many counselors, as the book of Proverbs tells us. 
So if we want to be the most loving people we can be, the best place to do that is in the assembly of more people. And again, another concept, as a pastor of a church, I personally learned that when I want to help somebody in my community, telling people that they should go around and ask for handouts should never be a healthy thing. We find no place for that in Scripture. We actually see the opposite. However, if somebody says, I'm willing to come and I want to get to know the people in this community and I want to get to love people and I want them to love me, then that person deserves help. And that's no longer a handout. Creating the power and the efficacy of the local church is literally the power of preterism. It's bringing the truth and the reasonable nature of the Christian faith back into the forefront. I love how Shane Claiborne, again, an author I've learned to love, he has a book called Irresistible Revolution as well as another book called Jesus for President, maybe a timely read for us right about now. And he said, God would save the world through fascination by setting up an alternative society, the church, on the margins of the empire for the world to come and see what a society of love looks like. Again, there's your in the world, not of the world. It would be this city on a hill that God would use to light up the world, drawing the world back to God. In the story of Noah, God exterminates the many to save the few. And in the story of Abraham, God sets apart the few to save the many. What we need to do within our movement to see power in preterism is get rid of the selfish individualism that is so human and so carnal. And all the excuses that we have of not wanting to be comfortable, not wanting to get up on Sunday morning, not wanting to have to go deal with the pastor on Wednesday night, And instead, find ourselves manifesting the spiritual nature of, I want to build the body of Christ. That I want to walk worthy of those details I read about in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14, not simply pointing out the chapter on love. But I want to see what love looks like in the essence of what the context the Apostle Paul is teaching in what it looks like in a community. What does it look like in the body? So, for our preterist community, and I'll end my point on this. For our preterist community, something we should really begin to talk about and really should begin to consider is how do we go about establishing local communities? How do we go about denying the selfish nature that wants to say, I can worship by myself and I don't have to worry about the details of gathering where two or three and Jesus Christ is in my midst because I want to do this my way. How do we get past that as a community? How do we begin to manifest the power and the healing power of fulfillment as a community? How do we walk worthy and how do we admonish one another to better walk worthy of those details?